Good afternoon. How are you today? It's Sunday afternoon. It's pretty nice out. Overcast. It's late in the day. Uh, Holly and I got out. Had a very interesting conversation with a guy. Uh, I stopped to pick up uh, a weekly newspaper that my op-eds appear in, in Middleburg. And as I was walking away, a man asked if I was who I am, John Flannery. And he told me that he and his wife liked uh, what I had to say. And I thanked him, of course. And then he broke down in tears. He had lost his wife on Monday. And uh, they used to come to Middleburg, and they'd walk together and go into the shops. And he was still getting adjusted to it. And uh, so we talk a little bit about, about that. I told him about the times when I thought I was going to lose someone. And, uh, and I'm kind of the last of the Flannery Mohicans, if you will. My mom, dad, and my brother, who's younger by three years, they've all predeceased me. So, uh, and, you know, other family members. And basically, I tried to tell them to focus on the good times, although it was so close to it. And uh, there's really no good advice you can give to someone. We all grieve in our own way. And the, the grief that he had for his wife was mingled with his fear for the country, which is one of the reasons I mentioned it. Uh, he follows Ari Melbourne religiously, or semi-religiously, <laughs> and um, he's very concerned about our country, as am I. So you don't often have a connection to a stranger who uh, confesses a very difficult time in his life. And so we spent a few minutes talking. That's what's been lost in American politics. When I've been a candidate, and I've done it at various times with some success and some failure, the thing that I like the most is going door to door. Because instead of pushing your view on someone else, you get the feedback. They tell you what they care about, what they think about, what they think is important. And I know it's anecdotal and it's not statistical, but somehow over time, if you do enough of these doors, you get a sense of what people think and believe and what they care about and what service means. When I ran for Congress, I described our group as a coalition of shared pain and dreams. The pain of things that are wrong and the dreams are the things that we hope for the future for our government and for ourselves and our family and our community. And that's where we are now as we approach an election. I think it's nine days away. We want the country to be the best it can be. And we have so many that would bring it down and do bring it down and think in terms of violence and lies and so forth. And so we talked about that a little bit as well. I uh, listen to the talking heads when I can, and I did today. And I heard one interview that both uplifted me and made me furious at the Republicans. And this is a pattern that's been re repeated, and it has to do with uh, our speaker's husband, Paul Pelosi. GOP Representative Tom Emmer heads up the uh, Republican Campaign Committee. He was on the air, and he was talking about, oh, you know, we don't want to have any violence. We don't want, we want to be very careful about all of that. And Margaret Brennan, who is the host of uh, Face the Nation on Sunday, she was just wonderful. I mean, she had on a business-like suit. She looked like she was there for business, and, and not just in this interview, but all the interviews and uh, round tables that she did. But what she said to Mr. Emmer was, so you have posted online a picture of you shooting a gun and then just below it, you have a hashtag saying, let's fire Pelosi. And she said, isn't that evoking violence and so forth? I'm paraphrasing. And on, uh, YouTube, on um, Twitter, I put up the link to uh, her interview. And she's just dynamite. Of course, you know, she is a Brennan. <laughs> the, uh, all of us, when you dig down to our moral fiber, in our value system, that's what we do. 
when something is wrong, we know that it's wrong. When they describe justice in the various studies, it's what's not fair. It's what's not just. And, and we know it on some level, even when we can't name it. Well, we know if somebody busts into your house at 2.30 in the morning because your wife has spent most of her life giving up her time from family and friends and everything else to try to build a political movement that matters. And yes, she succeeded to the highest reaches in the House. And if her father had lived, he a politician himself out of Baltimore, <clears throat> I just think he would have been crazy with pride for her. And yet we have this worthless man, Emmer, who would post such a thing, suggesting what? Now, what Brennan said is, you could say a pink slip. In other words, divorce the two events. And why would you put it? You're putting a picture of yourself up shooting. Fine, that's your sex, Second Amendment exertion. But you mingle it with fire, Pelosi. And only, what, a couple hours, two, two, so two days after her husband's been attacked. And she's traveling, she's probably there now, to California to be with her husband. Do you think Emmer would stop on the street unless he thought he could get a vote with a stranger that said, I just lost my wife? I'm not trying to get credit for myself. I think we, anybody who's listening to this and myself, we all share a humanity that we are hard to find in many of our elected officials and almost exclusively in the Republican Party. The Republican Party, when I was a young man in New York, was more heartfelt, if you will. This was the party, after all, that fought against slavery. I talked the other day about Sumner being hit so hard and cracking his skull he couldn't work for two years after that when he was fighting slavery. That's who the Republicans were. Not now. Now they manipulate and use. This is like a Shakespearean drama. They use the things they fought against to secure the power so that they can disproportionately have power not merited by the number of people who would vote for them or support them. I think one of the things that we lose sight of is how politics really works. I was on Ari's show, this is a long time ago, and I was with a couple of people and the House had passed some fabulous civil rights legislation. And uh, this professor sitting next to me said, isn't that wonderful? And I didn't want to be the buzzkill, but I said, it's not gonna pass the Senate. And I got pushback from friends and so forth. I should respect the accomplishment. I do in this sense. The Democrats have got a powerful agenda, really serious stuff for the citizens of America. And it's almost like, I've always thought of doctors as so empathetic that they're not fighters. And I've represented several doctors who would give pain medication. They were healing, not dealing. And they found it themselves adrift trying to fight for themselves. Well, some politicians who pass legislation and don't have an executive background and weren't prosecutors fit into that mold as well. They pass legislation that is good for the people, very good, for the children, for the older people, for retirement, for medical care, you name it. And then the Republicans voted down, why? Because every dollar the government spends, they wanted to go into the back pocket of a businessman on Wall Street. That's our problem. So here's my point. If we elect the right people to the House and the Senate, that impressive agenda of bills that couldn't pass because the Senate squelched it, and McConnell is a do-nothing, stop-everything member of one of the oldest deliberating bodies, certainly in America. So what, what is the missing link here? The missing link is the agenda that we fight about doesn't really mean much unless the party that prevails is free and intends to put it into practice. So if we're not saving our democracy so that we can consider such legislation, we're missing the main point of what it means to govern. And the question always is, what is a civilization? It's how a government treats its own. And the Republicans don't treat its own. They, they take and they steal and they thieve and they hate and they lie. Just like Mr. Emmer. 
oh, you know, he said, uh, what about Scalise? Nobody said anything about Scalise. Well, Scalise didn't have a congressman suggesting that the third person in line to be the president, maybe he would make a good target because that's what he thinks of it all. People like that are not serious enough to be in our government. Some of these people you wouldn't trust to park your car. So here we are in my cathedral of trees. And it's amazing to me that every day that I walk down this, and I have every day since the, uh, the pandemic started, uh, and I've continued to do it after I'm told it's over. <laughs> and what I discover is it's always changing. Is it Erasmus? <clears throat> Change is constant. And it is. The seasons, the colors, the shapes, the winds, the light, all of it. And I've always thought that the difference between Republicans and Democrats is a Democrat knows what a metaphor is. Also, a Republican has two problems, most of them. They're literal and they're poorly read. This is besides the other characteristics of lying and so forth. So, I am glad to be among a cathedral of trees, able to talk to you guys, nine days from us voting, and hopefully we'll shake the earth with the result. All the best. Bye-bye.